just as a child development intervention alone. They're both, what I would say, necessary, but not sufficient. That okay, this is the question I have. Yes, thinking. yes. That I think that they're, they, each one of them is necessary, but they're enhanced by having both of them. And that the enhancement may be one of, of synergy, that basically you get much stronger effect by having two. There are not many examples yet. There are some examples of people who have done two of them. The Jamaica study had both of them, but the, done started in the 80s. But the nutrition part of it was not really very strong. Um, so I think that it certainly makes sense to consider both of them. If you want me to talk more, I can. The, the issue with the nutrition alone is that often families don't know how to actually implement the nutrition. I hinted at that a little bit when I talked about feeding problems. Many, many kids throughout the world have feeding problems. And when you go to many low and middle income countries, if their children are not eating, which kids have to protest at some extent, um, then moms get really nervous and they'll do things like try and force their kids. So they do in India, sometimes they do dream feeding. Dream feeding is when the child is nodding off. That, that's, it's A, it overpowers the child's regulatory system, and B, kids find it very offensive. So those strategies don't work so well. Impact of nutrition on growth, brain, and cognition. Do you really have long-term outcome uh, measures and are there results in the literature showing that there's an effect? Um, yes, there are long-term outcomes of very early impact on uh, nutrition and early development. For example, there's a study that was uh, conducted in North Carolina. Um, it's called the Abbasidarian Project. There were approximately 100 low-income children who were randomized either to receive uh, five years of a high-quality child care that provided healthy nutrition, opportunities for learning, and access to primary health care. Um, and the other group that was randomized basically to remain in care as usual, which was generally being at home. Those children were followed over time. Those who received the early intervention did better academically. Um, and when they were 35 years old, then the, uh, their health status was examined. And it was found that they were, the children who received the intervention were less likely to um, have metabolic syndrome and had better measures of blood pressure. They were also less likely to be obese. When you looked back at their very early growth, um, you could see that the tendency toward obesity started prior to age five. It started prior to age two. So it illustrates that helping children develop healthy um, growth and healthy habits very early in life can have a long-term payoff. Thank you. This is important to tell this to policy makers. Yes. But what I would say um, in there is that it's not only about the nutrition piece that it also came with the early development piece. And it came with them developing healthy habits. So it's not one nutrient versus another, but it's a, it's a healthy habit as, as part of it. Um, as those children also had better wage earning, the, the Jamaica study showed um, early on, and other studies have shown as well. I mean, you know, the long-term outcome from the Guatemala study shows that as well. So I think, um, you know, some, t do you want me to stop? No, <laughs> sometimes the nutrition studies are wanting to have a developmental outcome. If you want a developmental outcome, why would you not put development into the input? So if you only put nutrition into the input, it's not enough. It's, not enough. Okay, it's a simplistic see, view. Okay, it's so strong. it's not, yes, it's necessary but not sufficient. Mm -hmm.